Good afternoon. This is Critical Talk with Professor Aminal D. And I am honored this evening to have with me Zahir Ali, who is an oral historian and educator who for nearly two, two decades, he's not that old in real life, has worked as a listener, amplifier, and preserver of the stories of often marginalized voices. Previously, as oral historian at Brooklyn Historical Society, he founded and directed Muslims in Brooklyn, a public history and arts project designed to amplify the stories of Brooklyn's Muslim communities and contextualize those stories in the broader histories of Brooklyn, New York City, and the United States. He also has served as the project manor, manager of Columbia University's Malcolm X Project under the direction of the late Manning Marable. He was the lead researcher for Marable's Pulitzer Prize winning biography, Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention in 2011. Uh, let me just move along as a committed educator. He has taught for over a decade as a lecturer at New York University including courses on United States history, Malcolm X, Prince Rogers Nelson. He, his current focus, which we're gonna talk about some what today, is on leveraging the power of American Muslim storytelling for social and cultural change. As a senior fellow of the Pillars Fund Muslim Narrative Change cohort. Good afternoon. It's late afternoon. <laughs> Salam alaikum and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, what I would like to start with, however, for our viewing audience is a video you did that I think sets our pace. So if you would cue it up for me, I'd appreciate it. I heard you never taste the bean powder. I'm a Muslim American. I'm ready to have some real Muslim American food. Okay. Let's try it out. This is exciting. I just tasted the only legitimate Muslim American food, bean pie. I'm at this spot called Abu's Bakery, the last bakery in New York City to make it. I've since learned that this pie made from navy beans helps tell one of the most essential stories about Muslims in America. And it's delicious. My name is Ayman Ismail. To grow up Muslim means to grow up being feared. So I'm traveling the country to find out for myself if there's really any reason to be afraid of American Muslims. It sounds like I'm putting an awful lot of emphasis into a dessert, right? But to understand why, you have to go back to the 1930s. To black American Muslims, the bean pie is the window into something much more significant. In this bakery, a 90-year legacy is being preserved. But how does this manifest into a pie? I went to the Brooklyn Historical Society to find out. You know, people say like something is as American as apple pie. Well, I feel like it's like as Muslim American as bean pie. <laughs> Zahir Ali is an oral historian at the BHS and is currently in the process of trying to preserve Islamic American history in Brooklyn. He's also likely the bean pie's biggest fan. I'm constantly being asked as a Muslim group yes. in America, what is Muslim food? And I was always like, well, I don't really know if there is a Muslim food. What I like about the bean pie is it is the um, only American Muslim food to be created. It came out of the Muslim community. So, so how? Part of the Nation of Islam's objective was to create a cultural identity that was independent of the legacy of slavery. So anything that could connect to what was quote unquote called a slave diet um, was regarded as something that should not be eaten. The bean pie was made to replace the sweet potato pie. Just like people got an X in their name to signify a break from a slave name, they also broke away from what was called a slave diet. So this pie would have been impossible without the advent of Islam in the African-American community. It doesn't just come from African-Americans. It comes from African-American Muslims specifically responding to their identity as Muslim. The bean pie is Islam in America. It is the quintessential Muslim American dish. Every time I've gone to any mosque, yes. anywhere I go, yes. anywhere in the world, every time. Okay, I'm not playing the whole clip 
And I would encourage our viewers and listeners to go on YouTube. You got to see this. It is really quite fascinating. But I want to use that to, to have you talk a little bit about uh, the lay of the land of African-American Islam. So often all African-American Muslims are lumped into one group with one set ideology. So I'm going to let you take it from here. Yeah, well, again, thank you for, for having me. And um, I think this is a, actually the, the, the story of the bean pie is a good place to start because, of course, you can't tell that story without the Nation of Islam. And right. you can't tell the story of Muslims in the United States and certainly um, Muslims of African descent in the United States without the story of the Nation of Islam. But what's so interesting about the bean pies, like food travels, um, you know, it's it's not it's no longer a food that is confined to the nation of Islam, right? It's still very much a black Muslim food and a black Muslim dessert. And the bakery that was featured in that story, which is in Brooklyn, is you know run by African American, we would say Sunni Muslims, right? right? Who are baking a bean pie, which originated out of the nation of Islam. And I think it speaks to a kind of um, fluidity that existed, that has always existed on the ground among these different communities where people went to different mosques and masajids to satisfy different um, yearnings, right? So like one community may be more politically oriented, another community may have highlighted more spiritual life, um, and people would oftentimes go to both, right? And so I think that that, that kind of helps us to frame out a conversation about the history and contemporary state of African-American Muslims in the United States um, can't be reduced to one community, can't be reduced to one historical narrative, but that there are still some commonalities, right? That speak to or answer to the, the kinds of reasons why people, um, why religion is relevant in people's lives, right? In terms of making meaning, in terms of responding to social conditions, and to the degree that those social conditions have been uh, in part shaped by, but not exclusively in part shaped by white racism, um, but also um, shaped by the desire to affirm and celebrate black life and humanity. Um, those are sort of the common themes that you'll find finding different kinds of spiritual expressions, whether it's the Nation of Islam, the Ahmadiyya community, the Ansarullah, uh, Sunni Muslims of various stripes, whether they are like from the Dar al Islam community or more Salafi communities, um, even groups like the five percenters that people don't really regard within the sort of traditional fold, um, you know, and other kind of historic communities that may no longer exist. Uh, such as the Ansar Ola community in Brooklyn, um, these were all really important communities that helped contribute to this this sort of tapestry. I mean, we we could almost use the prayer rug as a as a motif. Um, these were all threads that kind of were woven into the prayer rug of of Black Islam in the United States. Well, I think the other part of that is it it testifies to a, a resistance to an immigrant yearning for a singular Islam. African-American Muslims saw many different aspects. You know, I, I pray here, I go to this uh, seminar over there, I go over here to grab my bean pie as I'm on my way. You know, I may sit down to dinner and have some bean soup. You know I'm focused on beans, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that lively, fluid carrying back and forth of ideas and positions and conversations, I think was what drew people into Muslim communities. But it was also the outreach or the openness of Muslim uh, communities. They weren't so ethnically bound and I want to say anal retentive that parents and cousins and, you know, the younger siblings couldn't come by and hang out. And a lot of that went 
Uh, it began to go by the wayside with the influx of large immigrant communities. But it was one of the things that underlay some of this growth and development. Yeah, well, you know, I think that um, when people move from a society where they are a significant minority or a majority, um, and they, you know, uh, in terms of Islam or Muslims, and they move to a society where that is not the case, um, I think that brings into relief several things about what their religion really did for them. Yeah. Um, and so for, for many people, religion is either the container or is in the container of cultural preservation, right? right. And so some of the early mosques that were established by those communities were really cultural community centers designed to preserve the totality of their cultural identity, which included Islam, but was not just Islam, right? It was their languages, it was their styles of dress, it was of course their food. Since we were talking about food, it was also their courtship practices, there was their family, you know, families and educational ideas. Um, and, and I think that's different when you look at the history of, 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 of mosque development in the black community. Um, communities that were really looking to religion as not just a means of cultural preservation, but liberation, right? Political liberation. And so those communities tended to be more outward looking um, and have more of a missionary kind of um, energy that was open to welcoming people in. I mean, I think, I think one, if we would say immigrant group, and I, you know, I don't really like collapsing experiences into these categories. Yeah. But, you know, if you look at the experience of the Ahmadiyya community or the early Ahmadiyya missionaries kind of tell the story of the earliest arrivals, thinking they could do that immigrant ascension, that was the American dream, and then being faced with the harshness of racism in the 1910s and 20s, deciding that the best place to locate themselves was in Black America. Right. So some of the earliest missionaries, if we were to call them from, from Muslim communities or Muslim predominant countries, were the Ahmadiyya, um, who had a significant African-American um, um, membership as a result, right? And, right, but and, they also had some issues. Yeah, they would definitely have issues. With, with Ahmad Jamal and everybody, you know, Black music was horrible. No matter how long you study, how far, how wide, you can never lead a community. Yeah. All of the teachers had to come from uh, over there. Right, right. And they right. lost and really turned some people away from Islam. Right. Because well, they they were. Yeah, and that's why, you know, even though they may have been some of the represented in some of the earliest waves of what we would consider like the 20th century revival of Islam in the African American community, um, they're not able to hold that momentum, right? Right, right? Because of those things that you've pointed out. And and the group that really holds that momentum is the nation of Islam, right? Because the nation of Islam sort of responds to the material and psychic and you know basic needs of, of the community in ways that speak to people um, in their own language, centering their own experience, um, you know, in a way that translates Islam to them. And so the, the nation of Islam, of course. Is is sort of the the prototype of 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 what a effective um, development of Islam is in in Black America um, because it respected the um, process of syncretism, which has occurred in every society around the world. Right? If you travel around the world and go to Muslim cultures or, or communities around the world you will see that they have combined and integrated their own sort of prehistoric practices or pre-Islamic practices that are uh, compatible with Islam um, very much into their adoption of Islam. I mean, the history of Islam is a history of syncretism. Its founding was about syncretism, right? The, the prophet, peace be upon him, 
was effective because he was able to connect the message that he was getting to the existing compatible practices of the community that he found, right? He, he did ask of them to reject certain things, but he didn't ask them to reject everything because then there wouldn't have been no familiarity by which people could adopt it. And you know, when you look at the teachings of, of say the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he never presented Islam or even Noble Jura Ali, they never presented Islam as a new religion. They presented right. Islam as that old time religion, right. as the original religion. And so Islam was about reclaiming, not losing yourself. And, and to, to have that spirit um, sort of immunized or inoculated you to anyone coming, suggesting that you had to lose yourself in order to become Muslim. Although some people did, of course. I did a talk on Friday, and this was the exact complaint of the Spanish speaking community. These Arabs, these South Asians, they don't want us to be, you know, Spanish speakers anymore, not Latinos or whatever the going phrases are. You know, they want, we can't be them. We have to be who we are. We have our own history. Uh, and he was advocating, which I hope to help him with, uh, a new pedagogy uh, for people who want to move into Islam, whether it's uh, their understanding is ancestral or otherwise, but with these barriers that these other immigrant groups, and we're going to talk about this later on in the week, have tried to assert themselves when they just got Muslim when they came here. So that becomes a very interesting phenomenon. Yeah. All by itself. Yeah. But I would like for you to spend some time, if you don't mind, and take us into this Brooklyn project. So, you know, one of the reasons why the um, existing knowledge about Muslims in America, and especially African American Muslims in America, is so limited um, has been because of the lack of source material, lack of primary sources. You know, from, from a historian's perspective, we build out this, the retelling of the past from primary sources. Right. And, um, you know, the Nation of Islam has. As, as, as important as the Nation of Islam is to that story. Um, and I think there's been some attempts to sort of, you know, overcompensate and diminish the nation, which I would never want to do. Um, but, but one of the reasons why the nation story gets told as much as it does is because the Nation of Islam was such a well-documented community, both in terms of how the community documented itself through the Muhammad Speaks newspaper, which was consistently published. You know, if you look at, if we were to, to kind of mark um, 1975 as a significant change, um, you know, went from its earliest publication in 1960, this paper was consistently published all the way through to 1975 and then underwent changes and is still published today by, you know, as the Muslim Journal, um, by the kind of one branch that inherited the Net NOI's legacy. And then the final call, which was um, started by Minister Farrakhan's branch, has been consistently published since as well. So you, you have, you know, from a historian's perspective, just a wealth of material right. resources. Um, they, of course, recorded and provide and, and circulated recordings of speeches. So you have that. Um, and then, of course, you have the the volumes of, um, I would say, violent surveillance on the part of the state, whether it be local police agencies or federal law enforcement, the FBI, which adds another layer of documentation. So there's really a rich set of sources. But, but even with those sources, um, what tends to surface are the stories of men, right? Um, and singular men. So the Nation of Islam story is, is kind of taught as a history of um, Farad a little bit, mostly Yarm Elijah Muhammad, then Malcolm X, then Minister Farrakhan, and Imam Warathuddin Muhammad, right? Um, and so what doesn't get told are the stories of the believers, of the everyday people, the people who experience this in different ways, and certainly the stories of those who have always been marginalized in all archives, which tended to be women, 
um, right. and people with less resources. And so one of the ways that historians have responded broadly to the silence and marginalized voices within historical archives is through oral history. Oral history provides people an opportunity to tell you the history in their own words, with their own voice, with their own agency, as they experienced it. And so um, I embarked. How does a historian know that what he's hearing is as accurate as it can be? And the person is not just telling you the story you want to hear. Well, so, you know, there, that's such a great question. Um, it is, it's a great question. But I, I would answer first by saying, how do we know any source is accurate, right? Um, we, we rely as historians, we rely on newspaper articles, right? Um, how do we know a newspaper, a writer got the story right? We just yeah. sort of trust it. I mean, think about the newspaper articles that were written uh, in November of 2016, before the election and after the election. Oh before the election, God. they would have suggested one outcome. And after the election, everyone was trying to act like they knew this was gonna happen, right? So just because it's a paper doesn't mean it's dependable, right? It should be critically examined up, uh, you know, so what you do is you look at it along with other sources. But the other thing is that um, with oral histories, um, I think we embrace the subjectivity of the storytelling. Um, we embrace a, a different kind of credibility, right? It's not just what is being remembered, but why and how. Why is this particular memory important to the person that's telling the story? And, um, you know, how is it that they're remembering it? So it's, it's less what happened as much as it is how it, impacted the person that's telling you the story. And so you get out of that an even, I think, richer kind of, of resource um, when you, you look at oral histories. I mean, there's a way, I think, and there's a whole um, growing practice with which um, people are thinking about how to use oral histories or have used oral histories as a source. I mean, oral histories um, revolutionize the ways that people think about slavery because it was the oral history interviews that were done in the 1930s as part of the Works Projects Administration, the WPA, um, that was like a New Deal program that sent people around the country to um, collect interviews and record folklore and so forth. So some of these people who were working for the WPA went down south and interviewed formerly enslaved people or their descendants. And it is from those records that we know, for example, of the records of Muslims that were enslaved, right? Can you um, hear that just one more time for our listening audience? Many, much younger people may have no clue what the WPA is. Yeah. So part of the, in response to the Great Depression, which is somewhat similar to, I, I'm not trying to be funny, but you know, somewhat similar to what we're experiencing now uh -huh. um, with massive unemployment, um, one of the responses by the federal government was to create an agency that employed artists and writers. Um, so there were, there were theater productions, there were murals that were painted, there were photography documentary projects. You know, Dorothy Lang is a famous photographer who went around taking pictures of people during this time. So a lot of the, the pictures that we have of of people in bread lines and the dust storms and things of that nature are the result of these documentary projects um, under the WPA, which was the Works Prog Progress Administration, um, was this agency that hired people. They developed parks and they rebuilt schools. And it was a massive government investment in not just material infrastructure, but in human capital. And so one of the projects was that these WPA workers traveled around the country recording interviews with people, with elders, oral histories. They recorded folklore, you know, what kinds of games and practices that people have. And, and they, and yeah, and, and these were uh, archived and they are archived at the Library of Congress because they were done by the federal government. They, they belong in name to the people, to us. Um, and so we have rights to those stories. 
Um, what's interesting is that um, one of the um, earliest collection of those stories was published in the late 1930s. I think it was called Drums and Shadows and it was of the Georgia Writers Project, right? right? So, so the WK was like the federal agency and each state administered you know, the work of that agency in its own. So the, the Georgia's Writers Project had done all these interviews off of the sea, uh, off the coast of Georgia, that what we, you know, the Sea Islands, mm -hmm. um, Saint Simon's Island, you know, Sapelo Island, right. um, and they recorded people um, either themselves talking about practices or recalling practices of their parents. That at the time, the Georgia Writers Project people didn't know what to make of it. Right? There were people who talked about their fathers or mothers you know, bringing out a prayer mat and bowing down what looked like to them before the sunrise, right. having these beads and, you know, you know, kind of moving these beads with their finger while they mumbled some language. So the, the, the WPA folk, of course, because they didn't have a knowledge of Islam, they just were like, this was, you know, African, and which it was, um, but they just were like, you know, we don't know, this is some like voodoo, hoodoo type of thing. And what's so interesting is so you have that going on in the South and in the early 1930s in the North in Detroit, you also have this sociologist, this white sociologist named Erdman Bainon, who was working at the University of Michigan, who did a study of uh, migrants to Detroit from the South who had a, a embraced a religion that he called the voodoo cult, right? Because he too didn't have the knowledge and framework of Islam to understand how that movement fit within the story of Islam. So you have in Detroit, you know, somebody like Farad Muhammad going door to door, visiting black households, telling the people that he visited that he was bringing them news of their original religion. And then you have in the South, these WPA workers going door to door, listening to these people tell them about their original religion, but they couldn't decode it in the South. In the North, it got distorted, but eventually, alhamdulillah, those two strands emerged and we got you know, what we have now, which is a, a broader knowledge of, of Islam's long history in the United States that connects it to the ways that people have configured it in the 20th century. Um, so that was like my long, pitch for why oral histories are important. Sometimes yeah. the person listening to the interview does not know what they're actually getting. And it takes us years to listen to an oral history interview to unpack the deep wealth of historical knowledge that is found in them, like any other um, source. Yeah. So, so with that, um, I wanted to do a project to document the histories of Muslims in Brooklyn. I was working at Brooklyn Historical Society as their oral historian. And this project um, was something that actually when I- Wait a minute, let me stop. Yeah. What is an oral historian at an historical society? Yes. So- um, what and, is Historical societies collect stuff, right? Yes. Yeah, so um, historical societies like Brooklyn Historical Society, which was established in 1863, this is a very old society, um, was established to record, you know, it was originally established by elites um, as a kind of largely de genealogical society okay. so that they could record their lineage and their their inheritance of the world. <laughs> um, uh -huh. Gradually, uh, in the 1970s and 80s, of course, um, Brooklyn Historical Society evolved to become an urban history center that was not just a research archive, a place that had collected material um, objects and records about Brooklyn's past. It had also become a museum as a place to showcase various interpretations of that past. And it had become a center for community programming, right? Oh. So it was a museum, it was a library, it was an archive, and it was wow. a, a cultural center. Wow. 
And um, so, you know, and they're, they're historical societies um, around the country um, that operate in various ways to some degree as one or more of those things, right? Some historical societies um, are just, you know, archives. Other historical societies are programming sites. So that it depends. Um, as an oral historian, um, I am someone who um, collects the life stories of people through listening and recording and preservation and makes those life stories available and accessible to a broader listening public, either through curation and exhibition or through the work that researchers would do to access these stories to tell you know, the, the more richer stories that they want to tell. Um, so so that, that's how I, you know, and it was very fortunate because the, um, the Brooklyn Historical Society has a well-established oral history program. So when I began working there, um, I, I worked there with you know, the institutional support to do these kinds of projects. And one of the projects that I wanted to do um, was always on the history of Muslims in Brooklyn because the histories of Muslims in Brooklyn um, really says a lot about the histories of Muslims, not just in New York City, but in the United States more broadly. Exactly. Exactly. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of all the young people coming up. The Muslim world used to um, keep wonderful records and try to preserve this and that and the other. And then with colonialism seemed to get in all part the, the, the map and then the hardest thing to find, skip a bookstore is a uh, is a library that is functioning and has people retiring stuff. And one of the things um, I'm wondering right now, and I'm gonna ask our producer to pause because we're in the middle of a thunderstorm with lightning. Uh, with Abdul Wahid, 